So, <clears throat> yeah, it's brilliant, amazing being here this morning in the Lord's house. First service for me of 2024. The first are uh, always, always special. And so yeah, I want to thank you guys for, for being here. And yeah, just thank you for pressing in to the Lord's presence this morning as we were, as we were worshiping. It was just so amazing. To, uh, to sense there's momentum, what I sense there's, as we were beginning to worship was just that there's faith in the room. There's actually faith in the room. And so where there's faith in the room, anything, anything is possible. And man, God is, God is in, in our midst and He's moving. And for those of you guys who are new and don't know me, my name is Heinrich. I'm one of the pastors here. I have the privilege of, together with my wife Nikki and my two beautiful daughters, Annika and Kate, serving here in this congregation together with Yako and Lee and the rest of our elders. And it's such a blessing to be part of this congregation and to and to worship here and to get to know people. Thanks, Yaku, the first service I didn't have a watch with me, and so it was by faith we were moving along, and with the help of Nadia and David, they eventually got me to finish. So <laughs> I just make sure that I try and sort of more or less stay, stay on time. But it's the second service, hey, come on, and we're all fresh. We had a good holiday, and, you know, now like this pastor needs to just uh, uh, just warm up. And so... <laughs> so um, yeah, and so in the first service also, I asked you guys, I asked the, the, um, the people, if, if anybody learned anything new during the holidays. I didn't get a lot of responses. The, the one chap said that he, so he learned how to be quiet, so that's something beautiful. It's, it's good. He said it out loud. Um, so Yaku said he's, he's still learning. <laughs> but we all, we all took that as, yes, um, I think it is something special that God is uh, wanting to teach many of us maybe in this room. Um, to become quiet before the Lord and to listen to, to what He is saying. Uh, but anybody here, did you learn something new? Maybe something you didn't know, just a random piece of information. Maybe you bought a chappie, you opened it up and it said, did you know? And you learned. Do we still get chappies like that? Yeah. Anything random, anything new. You didn't know that when you went on holiday. Now you come back and you know something new. Yaku's kids learn to ski. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Water ski, I presume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, that is something new. That's not every day. It's not anybody that can say, I can water ski. I mean, if you can water ski. Uh, one or two, like, David. <laughs> you, I didn't know that. Uh, David can probably walk on water as well. <laughs> that's, the, that's Yaku. <laughs> Okay, I, I sort of learned to play a new game called Banana Grams. Anybody know the Banana Grams? Hours of fun. If you want to be humbled, come and play against Kate Rose. She's the Banana Grams champion. I thought I was good with words. Kate absolutely humbled me. Um, I was also introduced. Now, most of this I have to do with Kate, all right? So I was also introduced to a guy called the Kifness. <laughs> you guys know the Kifness? Okay, so the, the Kifness... South African, and he puts tunes to words and sounds and animal sounds, and just like so now, once it's in your head, it's almost impossible to get him out of your head as well. And I was also introduced to another chap. He's quite the English word is rotund, a um, little bit more on the on the bigger side, and he makes music. And uh, um, one of his songs has to do with um, this young gentleman that comes to him to ask for permission to date his daughter. And um, it's like, well, first you got to get past my rifle. Um, it's got a, what is it? What is the song's name like? I keep on forgetting it. Anybody know the song? Um, Kates something, Kates. Tani Kates Bes. Tani Kates Bes. Anybody know that? You don't know that? I didn't know that either. Do yourself a favor. Don't do it now. Please don't do it now. <laughs> Go on YouTube, Tani Kates Bes. Okay. You will, not for, you will not forget it, but... But I, I took some tips from him because uh, my daughters are growing more and more beautiful by the day. So I'm going to invest in some, some rifles. So if you have connections, please, please, please be merciful to the pastor. And, and um, hey, Gezipla. Oh, wow. And you, huh? No, can you come back all in one piece? Nothing. Next was Geskierni, no ligaments. Free so work welcome. Well done. Well done, eh? Something new. Yeah, awesome. Well done. The zip line is the zip line is in our midst now. Now we had a good time. We uh, went away to a little town called Ribiak Castile. 
which is a beautiful town. It's very rustic. New Year's was very rustic. It was amazing to be in that environment and uh, went for a couple of walks late evening. Uh, the place we babysat, they had a couple of dogs. And so I love dogs. I don't have dogs. I do love dogs. The reason why I don't have dogs is another story that we can talk about some other time. But I do love dogs. And so from time to time, I, um, I, I need to get my fix. You know, I need to spend some time with the dogs. And so there were these beautiful Labradors. And so we went walking with them. And then as we were walking down the streets, I saw there were obviously a few people away on holiday. And they had these signs up against their, uh, their houses, discouraging people from trespassing. And then you have the normal signs that just say, you know, ADT or whatever, you know, or danger dogs. But there was this one guy with a sign up that said, uh, uh, poisonous snakes, Rottweiler, and I know whatever else. You know, just like making sure that nobody would think twice about trespassing onto his property. And that actually set my thoughts going a little bit as to how important it is for us to Take adequate care of the things that are precious, things that are valuable, the things that, that God actually entrusts into our care and which we need to look after. And I know many of you during this time, you would maybe update your insurance policy and, and things and just take some time to do a proper inventory and look at what is precious, look at what is valuable, and make sure that you protect that. And, and so I believe that as we enter into this year, 2024, just at the beginning, that God will also want to remind us that there are some things in life that are more valuable than money, more valuable than physical possessions, more valuable than anything that you can put a price tag on and put it on Gumtree or Marketplace and say, for sale. <laughs> and if you were to think about it, what price could you possibly attach to the intangibles, to the things that maybe cannot go onto an insurance policy, the, the things that cannot be put into a safe somewhere, the things that cannot be quantified by a bank balance, but your life would be so much poorer without it. There would be something missing if you, if you don't have it. And, and I believe that, that God is holding before us this, this invitation. It's an exhortation. It's a bit of a challenge as well for us to make sure that we do not allow trespassing onto the precious things of our life. No trespassing. And um, so there are a couple of uh, funny signs I want to show you quickly about this theme of trespassing, I love the one there on the left, top left. It says, prayer is the best way to meet the Lord. Trespassing is faster. <laughs> A couple of other funny ones there as well. Due to price increase of ammo, do not expect warning shot. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. I love this one. Some husbands might be able to relate to this as well. Protected and secured by wife. Go on. I dare you. I'm just going to grab some popcorn. <laughs> yes, who needs a dog or electric fence if you have a, a wife at home? That, um, yes. <laughs> let's, let's leave it, leave it there. And um, this one, we're allergic to uninvited guests. Um, is there life after death? Want to find out? Life is short. Don't make it shorter. And then I, I like this one there at the bottom as well. No trespassing. We're tired of hiding the bodies. <laughs> and then some, I must admit, during the holiday times, this pastor, this introvert, I was a little bit like, yeah, I'm allergic to uninvited guests. I just don't want to see people around me right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm better now, okay? <laughs> I'm better now. Um, so I want to take us to John chapter, chapter 10 and um, just read a couple of verses for you. And as I, as I read this, this, this portion of Scripture, I want you to, to keep in mind just this, this theme around being vigilant, this theme about making sure we don't have things trespassing. Okay, so when I'm talking about trespassing, please remember I'm not so much talking about people here. Sometimes there are people trespassing your property. You need to get them out. <laughs> the beginning of COVID, we had a guy that jumped over our fence and during broad daylight. When I came out, he was busy walking one of the bicycles towards the gate. He was trespassing. So I started shouting at him and he <laughs> hopped over the fence again. Right? There's some trespassers you, don't, you should not be tolerating them. But primarily I'm not talking about people. Right? We're talking about thoughts. We're talking about attitudes. We're talking about spiritual things. We're talking about narratives, words and things that, that sometimes we would, we would accommodate to become part of our narrative, part of our way of thinking, part of our way of looking at life. Now, 
Before we read John, John 10, Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord watches over the city, he who watches, watches in vain. Unless the Lord builds the city, he builds, builds in vain. So God wants us to build with him. God wants us to watch with him. Right? So when we talk about being vigilant, when we talk about guarding what is precious to us, we're not talking about doing that in isolation on our own. We're talking about doing that in partnership with God. And so Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the city, he who builds, builds in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, he who watches, watches in vain. So the Lord builds, but we have to build as well. The Lord watches, but we also need to watch. Right? So it's a partnership. Right? So it's, it's no, not just God's water with God's acker. God, you watch, and I'm just going to keep my gate open and, and just like watch what I want to watch and be la di da no, it is God is vigilant. He's watching, but I've got to watch as well, right? So it's a partnership. Remember Garden of Eden? God puts Adam and Eve in the garden, and he is then in partnership with them, and he says, I want you to rule and reign on my behalf, right? So we're talking about this partnership. Um, uh, very quickly, uh, Nadia, maybe we can go to First Peter uh, um, first before we go to John, John 10. Just First Peter 5, um, verse... Six. And just jump there quickly. So I just want to read one or two of these verses for us, just to highlight the importance of our, yeah. Just humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, Sometimes anxiety would want to come and trespass, and then we kind of get into your heart, get into your mind. Yet the beginning of 2020 forces cast it out, right? Kick it out of your out of your heart, out of your mind, because he cares for you. And then he goes on and says, "Be sober-minded, right? be sober-minded, be vigilant, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour." And so we have to tell ourselves that first and foremost for us as as believers, it's not something we talk about often. It's not something we want to talk about often. But there is an enemy of our souls. And he's called Satan or the devil. And the Bible says he's our adversary, the enemy of our souls. And he is compared to a lion. The Bible doesn't say he's a lion. It says he walks about like a roaring lion. Right? And, and, and a lion that roars primarily wants to intimidate. He, when he roars, he wants to scatter so he can scatter the weak from the strong. Because he knows if he can isolate, then he has better access. He has a better chance of actually def or, uh, attacking his prey. Some of the most, uh, uh, most watched YouTube video clips are often around wildebeest getting revenge on a lion. I don't know if you guys have seen some of them. These wildebeest or these buffaloes, all of a sudden, they just gang up on this lion, chase the thing into the tree, and then cause all sorts of havoc with it. Why? Because they're standing together. But the roar of the lion is wanting to scatter, and it's wanting to intimidate, and it's important for us to understand that, that as we come together, even a morning like this, as we come to a church service, that it is not as if the devil will decide 8.30 in the morning and 10.30 in the morning. That is such a special time for God's children. That I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to take a bit of a sabbatical. I'm going to leave them alone. I'm just going to make it as easy as possible for them to come to church. I'm not going to cause any emergency. I'm not going to cause any crisis. I'm not going to bombard them with any thoughts of sleeping in or just going for that cycle during church time or, 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 or going to visit someone they haven't seen in a long time during church time. No, no I'm just going to leave them alone so they can just come to church. And, and when they're in church, I'm not going to bombard them with thoughts of tonight's soccer match or you know, the Netflix series that they watch for the whole week during the holiday. And, and I'm not going to remind them of the chicken that's coming a little bit later. And I'm not going to distract them now with thoughts of fear of this week to come. No, I'm just going to leave them alone so they can be totally focused on the Word, totally focused on Christ. And, and I'm not going to come, I'm not going to remind them of a brother that they don't like and some unforgiveness that's in there. And I'm not going to get their minds to wander and away from the Word. No, no. <laughs> he is still wanting to come in. And even in a moment like this, in a, in a setting like this, he would still want to trespass. <laughs> He would still want to have access to our hearts and our minds and our thoughts to distract us, to get our thoughts to go into places so that we can, cannot be in a position where, where God can speak to us. Or let me rephrase that, where we can hear what God is saying to us. 
because He's always speaking to us. And so that's why uh, um, before church services in the mornings, we, we come together and we pray. And, and, we, and we pray against anything we want to keep people who need to hear God's word away from this place. We pray against thoughts and uh, maybe condemnation or shame or guilt over things that have happened during the holiday or the week before. That we want to say to some of us, man, you are not going to be welcome there. Or maybe we want to make some of us feel that, hey, a, a touch from heaven, it's for someone else. It's for the guy that, that raises his hands and it's for the guy that always is friendly and it's for the guy that always reads his Bible. It's not for me. We pray against those things because we know that those thoughts, those voices in our heads and in our hearts, they are trespassing. They should not be there. And so I want to invite you and encourage you to join us in actually just saying, Lord, we want this to be a safe space, as, as uh, Daniil shared with us this morning, a safe space where we can hear what the Father is saying to us. We can hear His love. We can hear His acceptance for some of us even to, to, to be in a space like this and to hear God's voice calling us and saying to us, you are not a mistake. You are not random. I have a purpose for you. I have a destiny for your life. The best is yet to come. It might feel like a thorn tree, but there's life in you. There's life in you. By the way, Daniel, I just, I just felt that the Lord said, there's this beautiful sword that he has prepared for you. Like the sword of his, of his word but it's like it's a beautiful, shiny sword, and it's over your, I just saw it hovering over your, over your head, and um, that the Lord is saying, it's for you, right? It, um, Bernard has got his own sword, uh, but it's for you. It's been handmade for you, uh, and this is the year in which you're going you're gonna to use that sword, and he wants you to use it with boldness, use it with confidence. Uh, don't allow anybody, anything to, to um, intimidate you or distract you from using that sword. It's yours. But so you just need to lay, lay hold of it and wield it. And then Leon and Libanette, I just felt for you, the Lord saying the threefold cord is not easily broken. And trust the bond that the Lord has given you. Trust the bond that I just saw this cord just wrapped around your wrist. And I saw it being turned into almost like a, a, a trampoline. It says that it's going to launch the next generation. It's going to launch your, your son, your, your physical offspring, but also your spiritual offspring. And so trust, it's part of your calling. It's part of what God has destined for you. The threefold cord of your unity and your unity in God, the Holy Spirit. It's not easily broken. It's, but it's not just for you. The Lord is saying it's not just for you. So you have to just dig into that, pray into that. But there's a, there's a purpose behind everything that you have, have gone through. Um, and then, my brother, for you, in the corner, help me with your name again. Ruan. Ruan, yeah. It's felt the Lord saying, did he felt seen like, Falskuna says it's yours, and the Lord has given you the ability to walk through tough places. Um, and He doesn't want you to be afraid. I felt sort of that picture of the thorn tree, a little bit attached to, to your journey. Um, and that with that, I fell is you can do it stop me. You don't have to fear that the souls are hard, you don't have to fear thorns, you don't have to fear uh, things that are going to come and just stick through them because they're strong. And then I felt it's, a, it's the shoe of purpose and of destiny. So there's a specific purpose that God, that God has for you. Um, and it's almost like you've been wearing pluckies. And it's good, but pluckies for the beach. Um, but there's, there's, there's a purpose, a purposefulness to which the Lord is calling you in this, in this year. And don't be afraid to put them on, brother. And, and, and draw your shorties and your draw, draw what you will draw. That's what the Lord is saying. Wear what you want to wear, but make it yielded to God, the Holy Spirit. And trust the shoes. That he, has, that he has given you. Amen. Um, and so, so God, I believe, wants us, to be, wants us to be vigilant, wants us to be sober-minded, and he wants us to be, um, just by the way, I can't get this out of my head. It might be for somebody on the screen. Is anybody here dealing, farming, fishing, marketing, fish? Is anybody here dealing with fish in any, any way? Any fish products in, in any? Your sister. I just felt that the Lord is, is saying that there's some specific prayer that you need to, to pour into, into her life and pour into what she's, what she's busy with. And there's something prophetic that the Lord wants to, wants to unlock behind. And I felt like she's a little bit like the mule is unaware of the greatness of God's purpose for her life, that Jesus was on that donkey that brought him into Jerusalem. Uh, but that donkey didn't feel great. The donkey didn't feel amazing. But there's something significant about, about her life. 
um, and that, and that uh, the king wants to come and wants to use her to enter into his sort of his kingdom reign, his kingdom, his kingdom domain. So yeah, don't know whether she knows the Lord or whether it makes sense, but yeah, just just pray, just pray into that. Okay, so John John ten verse uh, verse one, and this is sort of the the chapter I wanna wanna focus on, with us keeping in mind that this chapter John uses this 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 chapter or the story within this chapter within the context of a lot of confrontation. Okay, between Jesus and the Pharisees, dead religion on the one hand, and Jesus really going after the vulnerable. So there's a woman caught in adultery that the Pharisees wanted to stone because she was a sinful, adulterous woman. Jesus stands up for her. He protects her. He speaks forgiveness and release over her. Earlier on, Jesus, he heals a man next to the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. And Jesus also comes and heals a blind man also on the Sabbath. And every time things escalate to such an extent that the Pharisees and the scribes, they begin to speak out against Jesus. They begin to plot against him. They at one stage, they want to throw him off a mountain. They want to stone him. So the tension is building up more and more, and it's going to come to a climax in Jerusalem where Jesus is being betrayed or betrayed by Judas. But we see this over and over happening again. Jesus deciding to call people by name. Jesus deciding to love people. Jesus deciding to break some hard religious rules in order to get to people. And the Pharisees, the people around him, cannot understand. At one stage, they say, he's doing this with the power of demons. He's saying Jesus, the Messiah, is demon-possessed simply because he doesn't want to do things their way. Okay? And so now he tells the story about the good shepherd. And keep in mind the good shepherd. Keep in mind Jesus, the good shepherd, loving that adulterous woman. She shouldn't be in church. She shouldn't be around the spiritual people. She deserves to be cast out. Jesus loves her. The, the blind man, blind from birth, Jesus goes after him, heals him. The, the, the man was lame, heals him. He does those things all the time. He hangs around with the sinners, tax collectors, and the prostitutes. And now in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, Truly, truly. I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in through another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's sort of our keystone verses for the year. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I being Jesus came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. It's a beautiful Beautiful portion of, of Scripture, and we see many different characters within this. We see Jesus, on the one hand, being portrayed as the good shepherd. We see Jesus being portrayed as the door to the sheep. On the other hand, we have the thieves, the strangers. On the other hand, we have the sheep in this sheep fold. And, and, and the sheep represent treasure. The sheep represent something which is very, very precious. Back in those days, maybe a little bit still like um, for many of us today, Meat, sheep meat especially, was a precious commodity. Uh, people didn't eat meat every day. They would eat meat only a couple of times a year, at big feasts. 
he would prepare a, a sheep for a special guest that came. And once a year at the Passover feast, they would all have a braai. But mostly they would roast, uh, not roast, boil the meat. Right? And, and a sheep was valuable not just for its meat, but also for its wool. They would wear the wool as clothing. The leather they would use for coats as well and for slingshots and for other things. They would use the fat. They would use the horns as a shofar. And they'd use the horns as a, uh, something to anoint people with. It's a modern-day flask. You'd probably pour some coffee in there and drink, drink from the horn. But nothing of the sheep was wasted. Right? The sheep was something that was very precious. And it was worth protecting and it was worth watching over. And so the, sort of the, the, the key person I want to focus on in this story so on the one hand is the shepherd, and we look at the shepherd. But the key person I want to focus on here is the gatekeeper. I think there are some lessons that we can learn from, from the gatekeeper. It says that the gatekeeper determines who enters and who doesn't. The gatekeeper only opens up to the shepherd, opens up to the one who has legitimate claim to the sheep, the one who owns the sheep or the one who has appointed someone to look after the sheep on his behalf. The one that, that owns the sheep has the right to do with the sheep what he wants to. He can decide which of those sheep needs to be used and sent off to use as a sacrifice, which will be kept and grown bigger for a feast later on. He owns the sheep and he can do with the sheep what he wants to. But this shepherd is not just the shepherd that comes to boss it over the sheep. This shepherd is a very particular shepherd. He lays his life down for the sheep. He comes into the sheep fold and is intimate with the sheep. He, he speaks to them. They know his voice. And the Bible says that once he's amongst them, he calls them by name. He calls also what the shepherd does is he, he comes in and he, he doesn't jump over the wall. He comes in and he doesn't bludgeon them. He comes in and he doesn't intimidate them. He doesn't bully them. He doesn't shame them. He doesn't guilt them into following him. He spends time with them. Because the only way you get to know someone's voice is by spending time with them. You have to spend time. You got to listen to the tone in their voice. You got to listen to the to the volume in their voice, and you begin to understand them a little bit more. Initially, when Nick and I, when we were dating, I thought that fine meant fine. It doesn't. It also depends on the day, time of the year, context is so important. But I, but I need to listen and understand what does fine mean. Could mean maybe. Could mean not really. Could mean no way. <laughs> and I needed to discover that. And I'm still discovering it because as Paul indeed said, it is a mystery, marriage. <laughs> but fine for one person would have been fine for someone else. And so it is for us with Jesus. We need to spend time with him so that we can get to know his voice. We can get to know what is he saying to us collectively as a, as a people and saying to us as a, as a, as a church that, guys, I, I want you to be a lighthouse in this community. I want you to shine your light to the outside. I want you not just to live for yourselves, that, that this church isn't placed here simply for us to have a good church service. We are here for the lost, for the broken, for the homeless, for those who don't know the love of Jesus. He speaks to us collectively, but then he wants to speak to us individually as well. And have us hear his voice as we are sitting here or as we're at home. And the only way we're going to get to know his voice is if we spend time with him. You know, he left us, what is it, 66 books to, to reveal his voice to us in the Bible. And so the way we get to know his voice, yes, it's amazing listening to sermons. And hopefully the sermons are good enough to inspire you and there's a life in them. But the primary way we get to know the voice of the shepherd is by spending time in the Word. Spending time listening because as we read the Word, it becomes easier for us to recognize His voice. And then in the midst of many different shepherds, that sheep, because the sheep fold wasn't just for one, one flock of sheep. Different sheep were put into that fold during the night. And then different shepherds would come into that fold and then they would walk around and then they would call each sheep by name. Say Heinrich, Jakob, Daniel, Ed. Come. And the sheep would respond because they recognize. And they would follow that, that shepherd, follow them into the pasture. And I know that for all of us in this coming year, that what we need more than accurate predictions as to what's going to happen and what the stock market is going to do and what 
uh, the politicians are going to do, and what's going to happen to the war in the Middle East and in the Ukraine. All of these things impact our lives more than having accurate predictions about the future. We need to know the voice of the one who is in charge of everything. The voice of the one that wants to go ahead of us into the rest of January, into February, March, April, all the way through into December. We need to know his voice. Because it is his voice. It is his voice as we know his voice, as we follow his voice. You know where we ultimately end up? We end up in John 10.10. John 10.10, I've come so that they can have life and have it in abundance, does not exist in a vacuum. It is not a little verse that I pull out of the Bible. Jesus came so I can have life and life in abundance. Hallelujah. I claim it for myself. That's that's a good start. That is a very good start to say, I see God's promise for me. Amen. I see his promise for me. His promise for me is different than the newspaper. It's different than YouTube. It's different than any algorithm is feeding my, my, my social media feed. His promise for me is I have come so that you can have life and have it in abundance. That is God's promise for me and for you. And sometimes things happen in our lives in, in 2023 or maybe in the previous 47 years of your life. In, in my case, they will want to sometimes militate against that promise. They want to say, oh, but, but do you remember what happened there? And do you remember what happened in that year? Or do you remember when you did that? Or do you remember that person? And then sometimes that narrative begins to shape our expectation. And we think, oh yes, God has got life and has got life in abundance for the guy sitting in front of me. And for me, he's got survival. For me, he's got just getting by. He's got an awesome, incredible, mind-blowing calling and destiny for somebody else. And for me, he's got just like an existence that is marked by the mundane and just going through the motions and not knowing why I'm here. And then Jesus is like, hey, can I just flash this in front of your eyes again and say, I've come so that you can have life and life in abundance. And then then guess what? As, as, As the the prescriptions that are being dished out in our pharmacies every day demonstrate to us that life and life in abundance has got very little to do with the car you drive or the house that you live in. Some of the wealthiest people are the most dependent upon drugs to get them up in the morning. Why? Because those things do not lead ultimately to life and life in abundance. And by the way, if you are in the process in the season of your life where you are having to use some medication, then God bless you as you continue to journey through that. Use that. It's not not condemnation. But what is clear and is evident is if we put our hope on something external to give us access into life, true life, we will be disappointed. Some of the most profound moments of extreme depression for elite athletes come after they have achieved their goals. And they realize, now what? I've, I've climbed Everest. I watched a docuseries this, this um, um, past holiday of a guy that scaled, I think, the 14 highest peaks in the world in the space of six months, something like that. Previously, the previous record took the guy six years to get there. But one mountain to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And after that, you have to get to the next thing. Literally, you need to get to the next high. And still, there will be this thing you need to prove yourself. And so for us as believers, who don't believe in magic, but who do believe in the power of invitation, because God's word, it's not a magic formula, but it is an invitation into life. It is an invitation into life. The way we get into life and life in abundance, for me as a dad, for my family, for us as a church, for you and your business, for you where you are dealing with your friends, it is by following his voice. If you have his voice, you have the keys to life and life in abundance. If you have his voice. Um, I think it is a well-known fact that nowadays one of the most common phrases, most used phrases probably in many conversations would have been, you muted <laughs> the last few years. A new phrase, you muted. In my home, it was very often, where's my keys? <laughs> what is the key to abundant life? 
Is it me achieving all of my goals this year? Praise God for goals. Is it me getting new habits established? Praise God for new healthy habits. Is it me achieving more things and finishing a degree or getting that breakthrough at work? Praise God for all of those things. But those things do not make for life and life in abundance. If they are separated from the voice of God. And if the voice of God leads me into saying, Heinrich, I want you to be focusing on studying this because I want you to study this because this will open up the door for you to do this and to do this in terms of my purpose for your life. And it's a whole different conversation. And even if I get to the place where I don't achieve what I wanted to achieve, to still hear that voice saying, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. What monetary value can you place upon the knowledge that you are fully known and fully loved. Fully known and fully loved. You don't have to hide. You don't have to use the mask of, of, of success or achievement to impress people. Post things on fake book and just try and get people to like as much of your life as, as possible. We can be on a Facebook with God face to face, <laughs> face to face, known. That's why Jesus goes through the door. He comes into Matthew's life and he calls Matthew by name as he's called him from his mother's womb. He doesn't have to go around him, doesn't have to speak to someone to speak to someone to speak to him through the door straight. I love you. I call you. My hand is upon your life. You are mine. The problem is, according to Jesus, that that you also don't just have the voice of the shepherd speaking to the sheep. You also have strange voices. Uh, when we were thinking about buying this property about two years ago, oh, how long has it been? Two, two and a half years ago? Longer? Three years? Uh, there were some people living in many of these rooms, even up here. And, and initially they had started off by just renting a couple of nights because this was a bed and breakfast, and so you could rent a a room for an evening or two. And then eventually what happened was they just stopped paying and stayed on. For a couple of weeks, a couple of months, some even I think was over a year. Guys driving Mercedes and having laptops and everything. Professional trespassers. They were trespassing here. And they'd become comfortable here. And so we were like, before this deal goes through, what needs to happen, previous owner, you need to get these people out before we take ownership of this property. Because we're not taking ownership of our promised land with trespassers on it. We want them out. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking, how often do we allow previous experiences to still trespass upon the promised land of God's destiny of our lives? That they've, that they've snuck in there. Maybe it was a legitimate hurt. Something happened and you were legitimately hurt, but that thing has become a rock of offense or hardness or bitterness or a lie that says, yes, God is blessing his people, but it's going to be for the guy behind you. Yes, awesome destiny. Yeah, incredible. But for the other guy, not for you. That thought is trespassing. And I felt as we were worshiping the Lord, he's wanting to say to some of us today that he's wanting to come and he's wanting just to, Forgive the, the image, but he wants us to vomit out some stuff. My, my dad believed very firmly in castor oil. Do you guys know castor oil? Castor, is it castor oil? Castor, it's not milk of magnesia, eh? that's something else. Um, castor oil. It's vulnerable, but it's terrible. <laughs> it works, but oh. Uh. And so my dad, before, before we would go on holiday time, he would go, give us Custard oily prophylactically, all right? So he would give it to us for what we are about to eat. <laughs> Cleanse the system before the time, before you eat the trifle and you eat everything at Christmas time. And then you would get another wallop a little bit later as well. But I just felt that the oil of the Holy Spirit, we were singing Nader an E. We were saying, come Holy Spirit. And I believe part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to come and just have the oil of His Spirit flow through our spiritual and mental digestive systems. Because there are some things that we have internalized, we have eaten, some voices that we have become comfortable with. You know what happens to a strange voice? If you spend long enough time with that strange voice, that strange voice becomes a familiar voice. 
and you end up sleeping with the enemy. In other words, you go to bed with a strange voice, the last voice in your head. And the first voice that you wake up to in the morning. And I'm here to say to us, that let's show those strange voices the door. Show them the door. Jesus. You want to get to me? You got to go through Jesus. I remind you fear of Jesus. I remind you anxiety and sleeplessness of Jesus. I remind you shame of Jesus. I remind you infirmity of Jesus. I remind you hopelessness of Jesus. I remind you financial lack of Jesus. I remind you spirit of bankruptcy and a cycle of failure all the time of Jesus. Otherwise, I pull open a chair and I'm like, yeah, have a seat. Why don't we have a nice meal today, fear? Why don't we have some nice fellowship, shame? I had a buddy many years ago. He would, he would challenge me. He was, he, was, he was severe. My first small group leader. He was severe. And I would, I would be telling him things that I was thinking from time to time and it wasn't fully gelling with the Word of God. And he would just like be, oh, so you were entertaining demons again. <laughs> like, please, man, don't like... Like have a demon out of, see a demon behind every bush, you know. But I was like, if, if I'm evaluating, is this God speaking to me? At the very best, it's maybe my flesh. <laughs> Worst, it's the devil. <laughs> and I'm becoming comfortable with it. And for me, it had a lot to do with insecurity. What I can do, what I can't do. I can't speak in front of people. I'm not as eloquent. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm too poor, I'm too thin, I'm too brown, I'm too whatever for God to use me. And it's like, oh, so you've been speaking to some demons again. <laughs> because is that the conversation the shepherd is having with me? <laughs> is it? No, it's not. It's a stranger that I have befriended. <laughs> and so I'm here to extend the invitation to us to kick some strangers to the curb. <laughs> Show them the door. Say, out in Jesus' name. You know, we sometimes use that in deliverances and it carries a very powerful phrase and it's power in it out and we cast out demons. It sometimes doesn't have to be that dramatic. It's a thought that comes in like, out in Jesus' name. The thing about this, the stranger is it climbs over the wall. What does it mean? It means it's, it, it knows it's illegitimate. Amen? Otherwise, it would have come through the door. <laughs> and so if it climbs over the wall, it doesn't belong there. And so you can... Kick it out again. <laughs> so I'm trusting the Lord that we will, in these coming weeks, spend time in God's Word. Devour the Word. Let this be your daily bread. The antidote to, to strange voices becoming familiar voices. Not so much focusing on the strange voice. That's not the solution. The solution is not trying to figure out every strange voice. Let me have my radar up. Let me evaluate. Okay, if this voice speaks in this way, it's strange. If that voice speaks in that way. No, no, all I need to do is I just need to, to know Nikki's voice. I know Nikki's voice, and I know that that's not her voice. The other person says, I love you. You're fine. You're amazing. You're great. No, that's not my wife's voice. Just get away from me. I don't have to, like, go and try and figure out what does every other woman's voice sound like. No, I'm going to just know my wife's voice. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> That voice. <laughs> One of the most precious voices for me when I'm preaching. Hallelujah. I didn't follow my notes at all, but I think that's it. Let's stand. <laughs>